Uh, it's great to be here. Um, really good to hear the the variety of experience and and um, what's brought you here today to learn about the Enneagram. Um, some of you have have already gotten to experience some of that the power and wisdom that is in this tool, and for others, it'll be new uh, and a chance to to dip our toe in that water. Um, I'm excited because it's one of my favorite coaching tools, um, um, it being a personality mapping tool. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of my background and then we'll, we'll dive in. Um, so I'm an executive leadership coach. Um, and um, before shifting to coaching, I spent about a decade on the international nonprofit side, um, helping to scale an organization called Room to Read, which is a $50 million educational organization. Uh, working in Asia and Africa. Um, and then I spent uh, the past eight years in philanthropy uh, and I got to work with 50 plus organizations and their leadership teams doing all kinds of amazing work, um, both in the US and throughout the world. Um, and I still sit on the board of a, a, an awesome uh, global health organization called MUSO. So um, international development nonprofit work is, is near and dear to my heart. Uh, for the past few years, I have uh, expanded and been doing more coaching and facilitation work with executives and rising talent, particularly in the nonprofit world. And I found the Enneagram to be a really powerful tool. Um, I've seen it uh, help dozens of leaders and their teams learn more about themselves uh, and how to grow personally and professionally um, through the insights that the tool can provide. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, going to give a little bit of an overview uh, of how it can be helpful. Um, just a brief introduction to the tool itself and then um, a really lightning round quick tour of the nine types just to get us started. Um, and from there, it's gonna get uh, much more interactive. We're gonna have time for um, some self-reflection and, um, and deepening our understanding of what type we might be holding and then some breakout rooms to really start to discuss and learn how others are similar and different. Um, and then we'll peel the, the onion back a little bit and get into communication styles and um, hopefully into tension and conflict. So um, we're just dipping our toes in, into the waters of the Enneagram today. Um, even with 90 minutes, um, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to explore some of it, but we can spend, and I do spend sometimes days uh, doing Enneagram workshops with teams. So um, buckle up uh, for hopefully what's an interesting all uh, right. All right. So I'm sharing my screen. Um, as I mentioned, the, the two key outcomes for today that I'm hoping each of, each of you walks away with is um, deepening um, our own self-awareness through this tool. Um, when we are more aware of ourselves, we can move out of reaction and into more response, which gives us just more choice and more agency and helps us uh, be more effective in relationships with others. And then secondly, um, just starting to understand what it might be like to be um, others. The, the tool is a map of um, nine core types. Under e each type, there are subtypes. So there's really 27 different distinct types out there that helps really explain um, who other people might be and what they might be thinking and feeling in certain situations. So this can help us increase our ability to relate to others couple of um, ground rules to get us started. One, this is a confidential space, so please keep everything within this room. And um, I know Jennifer is going to, um, before putting this video up anywhere, will um, do an edit pass to make sure we're not sharing any confidential information. And if when we go to breakout, if somebody shares something personal in the breakout, please just keep it there. Come back only with your experience, how it affected you, um, or the stories that you want to share about yourself. It's a judgment-free zone, so no judging others and no judging ourselves. Each type has its own strengths, its own growth areas, aspects that frustrate us um, in, in the type that we wear, and no type is better than any other type. Uh, it's an invitation to listen with curiosity um, and be aware of your own reactions. Sometimes our, our reactions are a source of wisdom. Um, so just slowing things down and starting to notice uh, what's going on inside and then lastly, vulnerability. Um, vulnerability has been proven to be a key aspect of strong leadership and to foster cohesion. And this is an opportunity for us to practice. Um, and then a couple caveats that Enneagram specific. Um, 
so the like I said, the Enneagram is a really powerful tool. It's a map. Um, but as the adage goes, the map is not the terrain. So no type can, can possibly capture all of your individual complexity, all of the ways that you've been shaped by family, upbringing, home, community, culture, historical forces, um, a lot of what we're seeing at play in the world today. And at times people feel uh, a resistance to being typed and just know that it, this is not meant to be reductionist. It's meant to be a tool to support you. Um, to help aid and discover what are the um, areas that maybe we haven't focused enough of our attention on, both the strengths as well as the challenge areas, and offer us um, ideas on how we can grow and, and become more of ourselves. And um, I'm a self-admitted Enneagram nerd and enthusiast. Um, I love the model because I've just seen it um, and experienced uh, its power, both for me and, and what it's done for me personally. Uh, as well as uh, with individuals that I coach and with teams. But please don't mistake my enthusiasm for proselytizing it uh, as the solution that everything must fit into. Um, hopefully you get something out of this and you grow from this. Um, and if it ends up not being the tool for you, that uh, also is perfectly um, uh, viable. So how does it help? Um, how does it help us increase our self-awareness? Um, so as we grow up, um, we go to sleep on certain aspects of our lived experience and it's as a way of protecting ourselves. Our ego gets structured um, and develops a persona that emphasizes what works and it works really well. They say that the ego is the most powerful algorithm um, out there. It's gotten us to where we are today. Um, it's an operating system that we repeat over and over again, uh, even when the situation doesn't, um, it, it doesn't fit the situation that we're in. So. As the adage goes, everything looks like a nail when you're a hammer. And we lose touch with the other skills and tools um, that are available to us. And we forget that the way that we're uh, accustomed to doing things isn't the only way, and nor is it the necessarily the best way for any given situation. And the Enneagram can help us shine a light on what we do and, and more importantly, why we do it. It starts to illuminate some of the places we can get stuck and fixated, the parts of us that lie beneath the surface of our behavior, um, and what shapes our motivations and our defenses. And as we go deeper, we can get to what is the anxiety or the core fear that influences everything else above it. And so the Enneagram can help us explore in all of these depths so that we have choice. We can decide what behaviors we want to continue to engage in. Uh, what we might want to modify and, and what we might want to bring back in to, to round us out. For teams, it can be a really powerful tool to help us explore interpersonal relationships and team dynamics. Once we know a bit about our type uh, and our habits and styles, we can start to constellate uh, members of our team um, within different types and start to explore different ways of communicating, different default ways of being, and then use this to unpack conversations. What does it mean for us individually? What does it mean in relationship with um, another person? And what does it mean for the team? And when we do that, we can start to understand each other better, um, which can lead to more uh, effective teams and, and quite honestly, happier and, and more cohesive teams. So. Just as a brief aside, um, in 2012, Google set out to answer this question, what, is, uh, what makes a team successful? And they coined this project, uh, uh, Project Aristotle. And in true Google fashion, they spent two years, they researched 180 uh, of their teams, they reviewed all the academic research, they conducted hundreds of interviews, um, both quantitative and qualitative data was collected, and they, ran it all to try and find this algorithm that would predict what would make a successful team, um, analyzing over 250 variables. And what they ended up finding uh, surprised them a bit. There were five factors they zeroed in on, um, factors like dependability, which is um, you know uh, com members completing their work on time and with quality, the structure and clarity within teams and roles, um, finding a sense of meaning and purpose, uh, in either the work itself or the output, and feeling like work uh, is having an impact and making a difference. But the number one factor 
um, that they found in building successful teams is psychological safety, which is defined as team members feeling safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other. And some of the ingredients that build psychological safety include staying engaged and being curious, practicing active listening, being inclusive and available and approachable, um, and inviting dialogue and modeling, uh, modeling vulnerability. And this Enneagram tool can help us build this psychological safety. It can help us increase our awareness of self and then begin to build that awareness of others, which is uh, are the two foundational elements to um, increasing our emotional intelligence. And it can start to help us unpack the um, multiple possibilities for way to, ways to get results um, and how we can lead in an agile way. And it invites the, the capacity to be more open and authentic uh, as well as be vulnerable, but from a position of strength, which makes us more approachable, um, accessible and relatable to our teams. And so as Google found these ingredients are, are some of the core ones that lead to those stronger relationships, uh, more cohesiveness and uh, better bottom line results. So just a super brief introduction to the actual um, shape and the tool. The word Enneagram is derived from the Greek words ennea, which means nine, and gram, which means something written or drawn. And this shape that you see here, um, they don't know the exact origin, but it's been traced back thousands of years. And in the last 50 years or so, it's been developed as this personality type tool. Uh, and it has roots in, in modern psychology. And each of these nine points is um, represents a basic style of people that describes why we behave the way we do. Each type is differentiated in terms of its focus of attention. So what we think about, what we don't think about, what are the emotions that a type tends to feel or not feel? What are the behaviors that are typical of a style? And what actions uh, we take or rarely take? And each type also has its corresponding adaptive strategy, which is what are the strengths, the habits, the challenges, and the blind spots? Um, we have all nine types within us, but we're one dominant type. Uh, we have one core way of say, uh, seeing the world, and that is shaped really early on. Um, some, um, some Enneagram teachers will say it's shaped before we're born. Um, all agree that it's shaped within the first few years of our life, and we don't change our type. What happens is uh, we learn to express the qualities of the type in healthier ways over time though we can slide back down into unhealthy ways during stress or during certain life events. Um, we're also influenced by three core biological instincts that are drivers in all humans and all animals. Um, the instinct for self-preservation, which is our safety and security and having enough resources. Uh, the social instinct, which is uh, focusing our attention on belonging and relationships and social groups. And the one-to-one -one instinct, which is sometimes uh, called the sexual instinct in certain schools, which is um, focusing the attention on the quality and status of relationships with um, specific individuals. And within these instincts, we have one that, that tends to be dominant, which we over rely on, and one that tends to be more repressed or dormant, which we don't have as much access to. Um, and the sequencing of what's dominant, what is um, repressed or dormant leads to certain flavors of each of the nine types um, called subtypes. And we'll um, briefly touch on that when we do a little bit of reflection on our type. Lastly, um, each type has what are called wings and arrows. Uh, wings are the numbers on either side of the core number. Uh, they're used differently by different schools, but, but um, I like to think of them as seasonings for our type uh, that come naturally as we're growing up and can be further cultivated by us to help us balance ourselves out. Um, they modify and blend with our basic style. And they're part of the reason why you might meet somebody that is the same Enneagram style, but they, they seem different than you. And we won't have a chance to go into the arrows uh, today, but I use the arrows a lot in coaching because they point to more transformational growth. They help us balance out more radically some of the energies in our type. Um, and um, give us access to um, aspects that, that we otherwise may not have um, uh, to ourselves. So now I'm just gonna take you on a 10 minute tour of the nine types, just so you start to get a flavor of how different each of the types are. 
and don't worry about taking notes. Um, there's materials that I'll share right after this where we move into reflection and breakout. Really just listen to each of the types and the energy behind it, and particularly the motivation for each type, because that's, that's where we start to be able to distinguish um, whether we have, um, whether we're wearing a certain type or not. So see which types are resonating, um, how your body responds to it. Sometimes our body will send us sense signals um, that are really informative. And note the one or two types that really land for you. Um, types also might remind you of a particular colleague, friend, or family member, and you might jot that down as a note. Um, and, and we can come back to that. So we start with the type eight and the type eight is known as the challenger. They're assertive and direct, very decisive and driven uh, and very confident. They're motivated to be strong and be in control and to avoid weakness and vulnerability and to make things happen. At work, they are big picture. They are strategic and resourceful. Uh, they display a lot of confidence and they're really good at mentoring and empowering others because they're very innately protective of others. Uh, they love supporting the underdog. They're straight talkers and they'll tell you exactly what's on their mind and they don't mind conflicts. They'll just lay it out on the table. And with all nine types, um, all of these strengths, uh, when they're overplayed, can lead to challenges. So eights like to go with their gut and they may lack patience for small details and they'll just blow right past them. The energy that they have is high energy and they can speak um, uh, bold and, and with intense um, energy and they have this desire to move quickly and they don't realize that others uh, might not move the same way. And so they can come across as intimidating even when they don't mean to be. And that can come up a lot in annual reviews um, of AIDS, which will often surprise them because they don't see themselves as particularly intense or intimidating. Nines are more easygoing um, they're non-aggressive, they're very accommodating and very patient, and they're motivated to promote harmony and peace and avoid conflict. Uh, they really seek to get input from all the others in the room, and they create their own comfort and routines um, as a way to access peace and harmony. At work, they're incredibly good mediators and facilitators because they naturally see all sides of an issue and are motivated to reduce conflict. And so they seek to create consensus and are really good at building it. Uh, and people loves, love working with nines because they're easygoing, they're emotionally stable, they're openly considerate, um, and just, just easy to work with. Um, they can get in trouble when they overplay some of these strengths and forget themselves, paying more attention to others, um, the uh, other people's agenda and opinions, and they forget themselves uh, and lose their voice and power. And because they want to avoid conflict, they may not communicate as clearly as they could. Uh, they might be intentionally vague or they might say yes to something, but, but not do it uh, because they fear outright saying no. And they may slow the momentum of a project because they're trying to build that consensus or trying to be inclusive um, in situations where, where a democratic decision is, um, is not available. Ones are known as the reformer. They're very conscientious, perfectionist, um, critical and controlled. They're really motivated to do the right thing. And, and they have this intrinsic compass of what's right and wrong. Um, and they're perfectionists. So they try really hard to avoid making mistakes. Um, and they're working constantly towards self-improvement and self-control. Um, at work, they have this innate orientation to focus on doing what's right. They strive for perfection in everything they do uh, and their attention naturally goes to errors and correcting them. And they're very well organized. They're very thorough and clear thinkers and they create processes and structures and plans. They can get into a challenge where they, um, that innate sense of right and wrong can be felt as rigid or uh, unyielding. Um, this motivation to do right and be perfect can lead them to overwork and get resentful of coworkers who they think aren't doing enough. Uh, and they can be highly in, opinionated and incredibly critical um, with impossible standards at times. Um, and again, not intending to or realizing that, but um, that's the way they can come across to others. <clears throat> Twos are very caring and generous, very friendly and warm hearted. Their key motivations are around being helpful and dependable uh, and anticipating other people's needs. 
So they're natural empaths. They tune into the feelings and emotions of others. They have this strong ethic of selfless service. They give just because they think it's the right thing to do. Um, and they are connectors. They're natural networkers, often working behind the scenes to help out, such as setting up for events, cleaning up, reaching out to people to see what type of support they need. Um, all of that support can lead to exhaustion and burnout. Doing too much for others and not taking care of themselves can leave them feeling exhausted and overburdened and sometimes resentful. Um, and because they have this motivation to be helpful and dependable, twos really have a difficult time saying no and setting boundaries. Um, and they can also struggle to provide honest feedback because they don't want to make others feel bad. Threes are called the achiever, and this is the type that I hold. Um, so I know it, it's near and dear to my, uh, my heart. Uh, threes are the ambitious, very focused, very adaptable, and action-oriented. Um, they're motivated to achieve goals, present an image of success, and just be productive. So at work, threes just make things happen, and they, they GSD, get stuff done. Uh, threes are very efficient and effective and know how to produce these results, and they naturally attune to what the audience wants and um, can really market to them uh, and have a chameleon-like quality that allows threes to fit into many environments and situations and just innately, without even trying, uh, figure out how to portray the right image. Get into challenge areas um, in pursuit of doing things uh, and creating this image of success. Threes can be too aggressive and either run over others um, or push people too hard. And because failure is not an option, threes will often overcompete, um, which can rub people the wrong way. And slowing down to a three feels torturous. Um, so they're apt to overwork and, and maybe hit uh, a point of uh, exhaustion and burnout. Fours are the creative type. They're very intense and emotional and very expressive. They are motivated um, by being authentic, expressing their own individuality, and being attuned to um, their true emotions. Um, they have a superpower of um, uh, aesthetic sensibility and artistic impulse. So they naturally tune into aesthetics and to beauty and what can be done to make things more uh, pleasing. They have high emotional intuition, which means they automatically sense into what people are feeling and what tensions and conflicts may exist amongst the team. And they have a capacity for depth of feeling. So they can make really good counselors and sounding boards. Um, friends and colleagues will often go to their four friends because they can go to depth and empathize um, even in very painful and upsetting situations. Um, and they value being real. So they tend to be truth tellers uh, in a team. And they have the courage to be authentic and call things out and surface what's really going on. Um, they can get into some challenge um, when they get hung up on aesthetics and slow down a process. Um, and um, because they feel so much, they can express too much emotion for other people to um, process. So others can experience them as moody or dramatic, but fours are just authentically feeling uh, what's true in the moment. Uh, and they can push others to be honest in ways that other people might not be ready for, which can create some discomfort or tension. Fives are known as the investigator. So they're the private, very cerebral, somewhat detached and very curious. Um, they're motivated to make sense of the world to conserve their resources um, so that they can be in pursuit of knowledge. They excel at gathering and evaluating information. Uh, they are usually highly intelligent, deep thinkers um, with very quick minds. They value technical expertise. They can analyze very objectively, taking the emotion out of what they're um, looking at or doing. So they're, they can contemplate things very thoroughly and even handedly. And they're very self-sufficient and autonomous. So they're happy to work alone without needing a lot of support. And they give that to others on their team. They can get um, uh, into challenge areas when they get caught up in the data uh, and um, they, can, they can get lost or delay action thinking that they need more information. And they tend to over-index on this um, intellect and undervalue other forms of intelligence like emotional intelligence, relational intelligence, intuition, 
Uh, and it can be very difficult for them to engage with people and share enough about themselves to really create deep connection. Sixes are the cautious, loyal type. They are very anxious and alert and um, very aware of what can go wrong. Their key motivations orient around creating stability and safety, protecting themselves, avoiding threats and risk, and being loyal and responsible to others. So at work, they have this talent for accurately assessing the risks and threats in a project or plan. And they're really good at asking the right questions, gathering and analyzing data, and generating useful insights about what's going on. And they're innate problem solvers. So they're constantly thinking about and orienting to what if scenarios. Um, and uh, they tend to be very uh, loyal, um, reliable, and trustworthy. Because they're so fear motivated, they may over index on negative data and underestimate the positive. Uh, and they can be very anxious uh, and cautious and get stuck in questioning doubt and um, analysis paralysis to the point where they don't take action. Um, and though they are very loyal, it takes them a long time to trust. So they may withhold uh, loyalty and, and withhold opening up to others until they feel safe. Um, and the last type is the seven, the enthusiast. They're very optimistic and spontaneous, very playful uninhibited enjoyment seekers. They're motivated to experience all of life's possibilities, pursue interests and pleasure, avoid boredom and pain, and maintain their freedom. They are really good at keeping things light. They're relentlessly positive and optimistic, and they have this infectious enthusiasm. They're very quick thinkers. They easily make connections between different ideas, uh, and they're incredible at brainstorming. And they're imaginative, creative planners. They bring a spirit of play, um, to everything that they do. And they plot out innovative visions for the future and how to get there. Um, they can run into some challenge when they accentuate the positive and avoid the negative too much. Um, they can just avoid uh, facing bad news um, when uh, sometimes we really need to, um, to face the music. They can also move too fast uh, for others, leaving others lost as to what to focus on. They can stay really high level and miss some of the details, which can, for others, come across as scattered, or they can leave confusion in their wake. And they can often be easily distracted. They can suffer from that shiny object syndrome uh, and wanting to move on to the next thing before finishing the current one. So that is a brief overview of all the types. Um, for those of you that can, I'd love for you to come back on camera. Um, and just take a couple minutes before we go into some self-reflection to see if anybody has any questions, if anything was resonating um, in a particular way. Um, and then um, after a couple minutes, we'll move to to do some to self um, do some self-reflection and deepen. Any thoughts or anything anyone wants to share? Um, this is more of a question, and I know you said this test is extremely detailed, so I don't expect like a singular sentence response, but how would you say this differs from other popular like personality tests like the Myers-Briggs test? Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a um, really good question and one that comes up a lot. Um, for me, um, the Enneagram has a depth that a lot of other tools do not have, uh, which both presents an opportunity and a challenge. The challenge is like today is a 90 minute toe in the water exercise where a certain tools, you can go type people, they can have an assessment, they can walk away um, in, in the same amount of time. The opportunity is that the, there's a richness here that gets really into our psyche. So it talks not only about our strengths and not only gives us characteristics, but it, it allows us to go to depth as to why we might be doing certain things, how we get fixated or stuck. And then most importantly, there's a map uh, as to how to balance it. So it's this really comprehensive uh, tool, um, not only to build some awareness of ourselves and to start to understand other people in the room, but how do we um, get out of our own way? Uh, how do we um, build more of ourselves and bring more of our authentic self 
um, into the mix because our personality, our ego structure, um, it serves us, but it also, um, uh, it, 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 um, it chains us up in many ways. We get fixated on doing things a certain way and we don't get to express other aspects of ourselves out of, out of fear, out of just not knowing that there's more to us. So um, that to me is the differentiating factor, um, that, that depth um, and that, uh, that map to, uh, to be able to change and bring more of ourselves online. Great question. Um, any other thoughts, questions, comments? Okay, so what we're gonna do now is um, we're gonna do a bit of self-reflection for each person to discover a little bit more of what type you might be. If you took the test beforehand, you're ahead of the game. Uh, you can use those results to look at a couple of your highest scores. If you haven't taken it yet, that's totally cool. Um, you should focus on the one or two types that felt most like you um, or, or where you got the bi biggest body reaction. Um, these tests, particularly free tests, are, are um, not completely accurate. No test is, is completely accurate. There's some um, paid tests that I use with clients that are um, closer to being um, fully accurate, but all tests um, have a limitation. And really that limitation is um, only you know your inner world and what, your, what motivates you, um, what activates you, what you get fixated on. Um, and so this self-exploration is a chance for you to um, deepen and, and get curious. And if you come out still holding two types, um, that's okay. Sometimes it takes people multiple conversations to really land. It's the journey of self-discovery. Um, so I'm gonna set up a breakout room that's a, like a study hall. And you can go in there and just quietly um, explore. You can put yourself on mute here. Once you've landed on a type, you might add that to your name. You'll see my name has the, the three next to it. That just helps us start to understand and get curious. And we have other resources to support you. Um, and then reflect on these three questions. And I'm gonna put all this in the chat. Um, what are the strengths that you have taken for granted or at least one strength you've taken for granted? Um, what if, what's a growth area? And then what if anything is new information? Like what came out of that? What's resonating for you in terms of your type? Um, what are you curious about? Anybody um, gain any insight from that self-reflection piece? Sure. Um, I mean, as I was That's reading fine. it, it reminds me before when I kind of learned about this, that it's, you know, it, it, like you said, it's not a quick and easy test to figure out what you are. And given nine areas, you know, you fit into a lot of categories um, with, you know, a lot of stuff resonates and a few things like, no, that's not me. So I, mean, I took the test ahead of time and it said I was a one, but as I was kind of reading through some of these, I'm like, ah, I don't think that's the most fitting. So yeah, it, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely trust your own intuition. Um, these tests, uh, even the, the, the premium tests that have a high degree of accuracy, there's still mistypings that happen. Um, because everything goes through our own perceptual field. And so some life events can skew some of the scores. It's really in examining the challenge areas um, as well as like getting very quiet and examining those motivations and fears. So as a type three, um, I continue to um, find it entertaining all the sneaky ways I compete with others, with myself, I compete with Waze, the app. I tell myself every time I set it up and it says I'm going to get somewhere at 1222, I'm like, oh no, I'm better than that Waze. I'm going to get there at 1221 or 1220. And I started laughing because I was like, oh, there's my competition again. There's my need to achieve again. So um, holding a couple of types with curiosity and starting to see how they play out um, can be a, a way to, to narrow it down. And then usually what happens is, um, and, and I, I, Mike, you might've already been in, um, in the study hall, but 
Um, one of the things that's challenging is there's nine types, but really there's 27 types because of these three subtypes. And so um, when I'm working with people, when we get it to the subtype depth, sometimes that can help us uh, explain, um, you know, it's like different flavors of chocolate ice cream. Um, you know, there's, there's multiple different flavors and we can't all possibly describe one flavor of chocolate. Um, and so these three subtypes can sometimes give us the detail that helps things click. And usually what happens is when things click, it's almost like the veil drops and we start to see aspects of it that we were previously um, not seeing. Um, did you, so you said the ones right are the ones to each side are kind of, you know, slightly complementary, you know, a little bit lesser emphasized. Yeah, they're, they're like seasonings. Um, uh, the, the Enneagram, and we won't have time for today, is this incredible map of polarities. But when we look at either number on either side of us, as well as the arrow lines, they actually are balancing forces. So like the eight was that assertive challenger type. And they're very serious and intense. And on one hand, they have the seven that's the positive enthusiasm, bubbly energy. And on the other side of them, they have the nine, which is the peacemaker and seeing all sides. And so you can see how on either side, it can start to balance out some of that energy. So often we have access to those through our life. Um, one way to get curious about types, and I can't remember if people were already um, starting to go into study hall, is when we look at our lives in our teenage years and our 20s, that's when like the contrast is highest and we haven't done a lot of our own work. So sometimes we'll see aspects of ourselves like the, the three in me comes out loud and clear in my 20s. You know, the, the achievement and the competitiveness, like I was hyper all of those things before I started to round out some of my energy. So that's another way to start to um, unpack the mystery. So, so your, your, however you acted in your twenties, it is probably a, a good indicator of where you fall in this. Is that what you're uh, saying? It, it's often a, a, um, it's easier to spot because okay. the volume um, of some of the challenge areas is often turned up higher. Like okay. when we look at the feedback we got in our first uh, um, reviews, you know, sometimes it'll, uh, mine used to say, you're, you're too competitive at everything, which is quintessential three. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so how long for more breakout? It, it, I was in breakout and it brought me back automatically. Yeah, no, we're going to, we're going to move on and talk about something okay. else. Um, and uh, another layer uh, around communication. Um, did, did anyone else um, real quick have anything that they wanted to share in terms of what's resonating? Um well, what's what's new? Okay, so let me resume share. So what we're gonna do next is um, explore communication styles because communication is so central to our work and to collaborating to others and is often the root of challenges within team dynamics. So I created this, this one pager. It's a cheat sheet that you can take home, print out. I laminate them for workshops that I do and for myself. And it's like a desk reference um, that helps me stay curious about uh, uh, other types and remember that there's different ways of being and communicating and that none of them are right or wrong. So it, it helps me stay engaged and, and not judge. Um, and when we develop proficiency in the types, we can start to adapt our style to different team members, which makes us more effective in communicating and influencing. It's like speaking the secret language of each person on the team. And so um, Anita and I were just talking a little bit in breakout, like knowing if I'm talking to a type six, I might communicate a certain way. And if there's somebody that on my team that I know is holding the type one energy, I might use some slightly different language because that will help them orient to, to the message. And ultimately communication is about building bridges. So why not make the bridges more effective? So I'm gonna post um, a link and um, I just need to get into the chat. Um, that's a link to this cheat sheet. What we wanna do is take about 12 minutes. Um, we might actually reduce it a little bit and take 10 minutes. Um, so five minutes on your own to review the communication style for your type, 
as well as um, the other types in the breakout room. So when you go into your breakout room, um, you'll just need to ask, hey, what type are you trying out? And someone will say three, four, and six. So look at your type and then the three, the four, and the six, and just take turns um, or, or um, assess and then take turns discussing what are your type's communication styles that resonate for you? What are the differences you start to see between your type and the other types you've looked at? Um, and what might you change and experiment with to make your communication more effective? So Mike, this is another way to start if you're holding two types. Looking at how the types typically communicate um, can give us some insights into ourselves. Uh, and again, what we over-index on and what we can explore in terms of um, how to diversify and how to balance our energy. Okay. Um, welcome back, everyone. Um, so what I want to do is just spend a couple minutes talking about tension, conflict, and how this can be used um, to explore that and with teams. And then we'll do kind of a, a debrief and a, a close in terms of where to take this. Um, so let me share my screen again. So we're just really going to briefly touch on this, and this can be its own hour um, or two uh, on conflict and tension. Um, and knowing our type and having some other ideas of the types in the room can really help provide additional content and context for exploring tension and conflict. And even if you're not sure of somebody else's type, and um, just uh, I mentioned this earlier, we don't want to label or type or put in a box anyone else. Um, but we can hold that curiosity and use that to unpack what might be going on uh, in, in the room. So one thing to note, and particularly for, for leaders of teams and of organizations, um, certain types have an energy that's intense, it's quick thinking, it's confident, that can, can intimidate or take air out, uh, take up the air in a room. And um, nothing is wrong with that. But I know from my lived experience that my energy uh, and my confidence with which I spoke uh, intimidated other people. And in my mind, I wasn't doing enough. So that's where we start to see some of this conflict. I'm like, I need to be doing more. And I get feedback later on uh, that it's too much. So three sevens and eights will quite literally need to learn how to sit back and bring their energy back. Uh, to let other people talk, other voices, um, and sometimes wait till the end of a meeting to share. Uh, and I trained myself to, to sit on my hands as a way to bring my energy back so that, so that other types in the room could share more. Some types are over-indexed towards other people. Um, so if you notice in your meetings, you know, twos and nines are, are most commonly this way. They forget them. They're tending to other people. They forget themselves. And if you notice that, or if you know you have twos and nines on your team, you can invite them back into the conversation to share what, what's going on with you. What are you feeling and sensing in the room? Or what's your opinion on this? Um, and that's a great reminder to them to bring themselves back into the equation. Some types have a bias towards action and making quick decisions. Um, and they need to slow down to start talking about details or risks or other people's feelings. And other types need a nudge to move into action. They can be get caught up in thought and analysis or questioning or feelings or their own stories or the need to build consensus. And so, again, recognizing these tendencies, recognizing who's in the room with us, we can um, orchestrate uh, in a way that, that invites everybody in, uh, invites everyone to contribute their strengths. And um, that builds that cohesiveness, that psychological safety. Um, we can also use it to get curious about um, uh, our interpersonal dynamics. So I, uh, there's an endless number of these. I'm only going to touch on a couple of them. But how knowing our different types can start to help us unpack conflict. So ones are the type that are thinking, hey, I'm, I'm just giving you these opinions. It's not personal. It's just what you did is wrong. I see the error. You know, they are oriented towards perfectionism and right and wrong, and sometimes they can come off as too critical. That hits a two very differently, or a three is the same, which is like, I'm, I'm trying so hard to please you. For a three, it's I'm trying so hard to achieve. 
and that feedback can cut right through us. Um, sixes and threes, I was explaining this, I think um, it was with Anita, but like I had a six boss who was always talking about risks and what we hadn't looked at, what I hadn't, had I asked this question, I had done this, had I played out this scenario. And for me, I took that as he's asking lots of questions, so I might, I must not be doing a good job. And uh, what I realized was that if I could put a six hat on and start looking at the world through the lens of risk and the ways things could go wrong and share that, that he could move really quickly to a decision. I just needed to learn how to speak his language a little bit more. And the last one um, example, just to illustrate uh, sevens, everyone excited, you know, be happy, let's be extroverted, positive and animated. And a five can be like, whoa, this is way too much energy for me. Like boundaries are important to me, introspection and time to think and slow down. So that type of energy can, can create tension and conflict. And when you overlay a power dynamic, if the seven is the, the leader of the team and the five is um, like a direct report, we can then start overlaying our stories. Oh, the, you know, the five on my team is not engaged because they're not expressing the way I am. Well, they're, they're just, they're different. They process and they need different things. So these are all ways that when we get curious and we learn about our type and other types, um, it can really help bring oxygen back into conversation. And this is how we can start bringing it into teams, um, you know, and, and how we can start increasing psychological safety. There's so much depth. This is a map uh, of one of the schools that I've been trained in where we start to constellate teams. And you can see on this example that a good chunk of the team and the leader, which is the bigger uh, stick figure was eight. So it's assertive action oriented energy. And then you've got a few members in different places um, that may not have that same expression um, they might have more feeling energy and less action, or they might need more time to think. And when we start to unpack this, we can start to assess and have conversations. The Enneagram is almost like it points to the things that are lying beneath the surface with teams, where we can then start to talk about challenge areas, where there are imbalances, what it's like to be in the minority style, uh, and what the team's missing. So in a team that's all energy action and very little feeling uh, is, is lopsided and, and they're missing out on certain things. Um, you know, this is an example of a team that was really high in thinking energy, which is all process and approach and analyzing, but really low feeling energy, which is like, how, how is this gonna impact people on the team or customers? No, t no energy type is right or wrong. We, we want there to be balance between thinking, feeling and action. So again, we can um, use the results of um, team reports to really start to, uh, to unpack what are people's experiences and how is it serving the team and how is it hindering the team. Um, one last example is, is um, the way we go out and get what we want. This was a team and a leader that was very assertive. So that eight energy, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna move, I'm gonna be biased towards action and be practical. Uh, and um, be direct. Well, there's other ways to do that. Compliant energy is more adaptive and more tuning into other people's needs um, and listening. Withdrawn is more reflective and taking time to be in our bodies and our heads. Um, we need all of these. And if we're a certain type, but we're on a team that's a different energy type, that can be really challenging. Um, and so Again, none of these are right or wrong. We're looking for balance and we're looking to understand um, how does it serve us and what does it cost us? Uh, and there are a number of these um, assessment factors that show up when we aggregate uh, individual types that can really help us create healthier, more cohesive um, and psychologically safer teams. Um, that covers a lot of it. Um, so I wanted to spend the last few minutes just hearing questions, what's coming up or what ahas are percolating. And we'll take the last couple of minutes just to talk about um, where you can take it from here. 